Welcome, everyone. This is a joint hearing of the Subcommittee on Economic Growth, Energy Policy, Regulatory Affairs, and the Subcommittee on Crime and Federal Government Surveillance. We'll come to order. Uh, again, I want to welcome everyone, and without objection, the Chair may declare a recess at any time. Without objection, the following members are waived on to the Subcommittee for the purpose of questioning witnesses. Representative Andrew Clyde of Georgia, Representative Clay Higgins of Louisiana, Representative Wesley Hunt of Texas, Representative Chip Roy of Texas, Representative Maxwell Frost of Florida, Representative Eric Swalwell from California, Representative Joe Nugese from Colorado, Representative Glenn Ivey of Maryland, and the majority and the minority will can each control 10 minutes for the purpose of opening statements. I recognize myself for the purpose of making an opening statement. Again, good morning and welcome to today's joint hearing with the Oversight, Accountability, and Subcommittee on Economic Growth, Energy Policy, and Regulatory Affairs and the Judiciary Committee, Subcommittee on Crime and Federal Government Surveillance. I want to thank Chairman Biggs and his staff for joining us in this critical oversight hearing to explore and expose government overreach by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. The Second Amendment to the United States Constitution plainly states, quote, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, shall not be infringed, four key and critical words. Ever since Mr. Biden took office, his administration has actively sought to infringe on this right. And I'm deeply concerned that the ATF and their recent actions against firearms manufacturers, federal firearms licenses, or FFLs, and law-abiding Americans who wish to procure and use firearms. Under the Biden administration, the ATF has been weaponized against gun owners and Americans who wish to acquire firearms in numerous ways in recent years. The ATF issued the, quote, frame or receiver, unquote, final rule in April of 2022, infringing on Americans' ability to assemble their own firearms from component parts. More recently, the ATF issued a file rule at the end of January of 2023 that will, effective, you know, will have an effective impact of criminalizing the possession of stabilizing braces in most instances, even though those braces were lawful to possess for over a decade by the ATF's own guidance. These braces were originally designed to assist disabled veterans who were physically unable to utilize traditional pistols for self-defense or to enjoy recreational firearms activity. The Congressional Research Service estimates that, now get this, approximately 40 million of these devices are already in circulation. On November 26, 2012, over a decade ago, the Obama administration, their own ATF firearms technology branch, issued a letter to Mr. Alex Bosco, one of our witnesses here today, and the inventor of the stabilizing brace. The letter clearly stated that the ATF finds that the submitted forearm brace when attached to a firearm does not, does not convert that weapon to be fired from the shoulder and would not alter the classification of a pistol or other firearm. It also stated that such a firearm would not be subject to the National Act or NFA controls. In fact, they underlined would not be. It's underlined in the letter. Millions of people acquired stabilizing braces relying on the ATF's determination, and they did it in good faith, made over a decade ago under the Obama administration that these ingenious devices were perfectly legal and did not convert a firearm into a short barrel rifle subject to NFA controls. Now, anyone who has a stabilizing brace will be committing a crime after May 31st of this year unless they permanently remove and dispose of the stabilizing brace, turn in their firearm to a local ATF office, destroy the firearm, or try to obtain an NFA registration through a Byzantine process that includes marking the firearm so it can be traced. This rule will effectively turn many law-abiding uh, law gun owners into criminals if they fail to comply, even though Congress did not act. We didn't pass any new criminal laws or penalties related to stabilizing braces. We had unelected bureaucrats create a rule. It's not the way this should work. In addition to these overreaching regulations, the ATF has abused its uh, enforcement authority at the direction of President Biden and other gun control advocates who simply don't care about the Second Amendment and by extension our Constitution or the proper role of government. In June of 2021, Mr. Biden directed the Department of Justice to adopt a zero tolerance policy when inspecting firearms merchants, known as again the FFL, and to revoke their license for any violation no matter how minor or unintentional. This policy has led the ATF to revoking licenses on the basis of small and technical paperwork errors without showing any pattern, intent, practice, or maternality. 
Revocations have skyrocketed in 2022 alone. The ETF revoked 90 licenses more than any other year in 2006. So at the end of the day, unfortunately, the actions taken by the ATF have clearly demonstrated that the agency has changed its focus from those who commit crime to law-abiding Americans who wish to exercise their constitutional rights. Instead of going after actual criminals, the ATF, by changing the rules without any input from Congress, is trying to turn law-abiding citizens into criminals. It's unacceptable, it's unfair, and quite frankly, it's unconstitutional. This hearing will examine how the Biden administration's ATF has engaged in a host of practices to chip away at your constitutional rights. I want to thank the witnesses for appearing today and look forward to their testimony. I now yield to Chairman Biggs for the purpose of making an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to be here today. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and your staff for hosting this important hearing today. Uh, the business before us today is a hearing entitled ATF's Assault on the Second Amendment. When is enough enough, close quote? And that really is the, the question of this. When is enough enough? That is a question that we have to resolve because there is a concerted effort to change the regulations that ATF has put in place and that millions of people have relied upon. ATF is engaged in various practices that seek to undermine the Second Amendment rights of Americans across the United States. The Biden administration has weaponized the ATF as it has weaponized every institution of our federal government. And this, this weaponization is an attack on law-abiding Americans. It is time for Congress to uphold the appropriate checks and balances by examining these actions by its own government against the American people. Hopefully today's hearing is just the beginning of holding ATF and countless other agencies under this administration accountable for its lawless overregulation of law-abiding Americans. And the good news is this is just the beginning of oversight as we've been informed today that ATF will come to a hearing in April. We're having this hearing in part because the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives has abused its rulemaking authority, authority delegated to it by Congress, this body. Earlier this year, ATF issued a final rule titled Factoring Criteria for Firearms with Attached Stabilizing Braces. That rule effectively bans pistol stabilizing braces nationwide. We will hear today from the inventor of those braces. Disabled persons, including the disabled veterans for whom the pistol brace originally was created, will lose the benefit of this useful tool and potentially their ability to operate firearms entirely. The final rule provides that pistols equipped with stabilizing braces meet the definition of a firearm under the National Firearms Act and that any weapons with stabilizing braces or similar attachments that constitute rifles under the NFA must be registered. Under this rule, millions of law-abiding gun owners will be forced to remove their stabilizing braces from their pistols, install longer gun barrels, register their weapons as short-barreled rifles, or destroy their braced weapons or, or face felony charges. You heard that correctly. Millions of law-abiding Americans will be turned into felons overnight by the stroke of a pen and without any congressional action. In other words, by unelected bureaucrats who believe they can make law, apply law, enforce and adjudicate law. That is something every American should be concerned about because that is the definition that James Madison wrote so eloquently in the 62nd Federalist is the definition of tyranny. And it doesn't just apply to this agency. Those of you who applauded in this agency, will you applaud it in every other agency when those when an administration changes and you've been relying on a rule and it changes without your elected representative weighing in on it. This is an inter, not, not an international, but a, a nationwide threat. This is not what our nation's founders intended. This rule terrifies my own constituents. 
They ask me how Congress passed this law. They're shocked when I describe the administrative rulemaking process. They did not vote for this. They didn't elect the individuals making these decisions. And in fact, I didn't vote for this. That is a huge problem. The pistol brace rule exceeds the ATF's statutory authority. Congress has neither criminalized the use of pistol braces under the Gun Control Act, nor authorized the regulation under the National Firearms Act. To make matters worse, for more than a decade, ATF actually told the manufacturers and consumers of pistol braces that the devices were perfectly legal before this abrupt about face. That can happen with every agency. I hope you're not applauding this abuse of bureaucratic authority today because you happen to be sympathetic with what this rule is. Because I can tell you, every agency can then turn on the American citizen. When ATF isn't exceeding their statutory authority criminalizing products they once deemed legal, they're making it more difficult for law-abiding Americans to purchase firearms by capriciously revoking the licenses of American gun dealers. The Biden administration, acting on behalf of the gun control lobby, has targeted firearm businesses. Another example, soon after taking office, President Biden demanded the Justice Department adopt a zero tolerance policy to revoke federal firearms licenses from those who committed willful violations of the law. That wasn't what the law is. There was no statutory authority for that. But shortly thereafter, ATF updated its Federal Firearms Licensee Quick Reference and Best Practices Guide to state ATF will, absent extraordinary circumstances, initiate proceedings to revoke the license of any dealer that has committed a willful regulatory violation of the Gun Control Act for specified violations. ATF has begun to revoke the licenses of FFLs for simple, technical, and non-material paperwork violations, violations that are anything but willful. They are revoking licenses for minor paperwork violations that have no bearing whatsoever on public safety. ATF's overzealous enforcement of paperwork infra infractions is shutting down small businesses and diverting resources away from holding criminals accountable. FFLs and law-abiding citizens are not the cause of firearm-related deaths. The Biden administration knows this. If it were concerned with safety, they would, be, they would not be the most soft on crime administration in my lifetime. Guns are not the problem. Law-abiding gun owners are not the problem. Violent criminals whose sentences are cut short due to lax prosecution, who roam the streets instead of being incarcerated are the problem. The ATF should be directing its agents to go after these criminals, not directing their agents to check for technical paperwork errors from FFLs and chase down disabled persons with pistol braces. When is enough enough? Well, I think we have seen enough. And I hope that we can act to put an end to this ATF overreach. And I would suggest that the most effective approach is to reduce funding, or better still, eliminate all funding, and even better, eliminate this woke, weaponized agency. I yield back. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Ms. Bush for the purpose of making an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our ranking members, Raskin and Nadler, um, and ranking member Jackson Lee, as well as to the gun safety advocates in the room and to all the survivors in the room. St. Louis and I are here today to talk about the extraordinary violence gun violence epidemic in this country. In St. Louis and nationwide, gun violence is a public health emergency and common sense regulations are a necessity. As a survivor of gun violence, I know firsthand the urgency of this issue. When I was in my early 20s, I found myself in a relationship with an abusive partner. He had guns. He kept one in the kitchen cabinet and another in between our pillows at night when we slept. One day my abuser did not approve of the way I was cooking food. He got upset and he began to hit me. I ran out the back door and as I ran, I remember thinking to myself, he was behind me 
and now he's not. Why isn't he chasing me? Where did he go? Where is he? Next thing I knew, I heard gunshots. Gunshots aimed at me. My experience is not an anomaly. It is one too many survivors of gun violence know all too well. And it is not my only experience. I survived that harrowing and traumatic experience, but many others have not. Just five months ago, a shooter opened fire on students and teachers at the Central Visual and Performing Arts High School in St. Louis, a predominantly black school. Two people were killed, seven were injured, and the entire CVPA and Collegiate School of Medicine and Bioscience community was traumatized. Like so many shootings, shootings this one could have been prevented. The shooter failed an FBI background check and his own mother had concerns, but his gun was unable to be confiscated because Republican anti-gun safety lawmakers refused to enact a red flag law in Missouri. Gun violence is now the leading cause of death for children and teenagers in the United States, with black children eight times more likely, eight, eight times more likely to die from firearms than white children. Two thirds of intimate partner homicides in the United States are committed with a gun, and 80% of intimate partner firearm homicide victims are women. Nearly 80% of homicides are committed with a firearm, and this year, we have already had more than 100 mass shootings. It's only March. The cause of these statistics is obvious. This country has more guns than people. There are approximately 400 million privately owned firearms in the United States, which has a population of 332 million. The US is home to nearly half of the world's civilian firearms. But for many Republicans, this is not enough. Students being murdered at their desks is not enough for them to value lives over toys. Republicans want the US to have an even higher share of the world's gun supply. They don't want common sense regulations on gun ownership. Their perverted view of the Second Amendment compels them to argue against reasonable restrictions. We're asking for reasonable restrictions and against our work has to be to save lives. Republicans' refusal to accept common sense regulations is why we're here today. As killing machines flood rural and urban communities and slaughter our children, they want to pretend that regulating ghost guns is, is an assault on our liberties. They want to pretend that regulating stabilizing braces intended to convert a pistol into a short barrel rifle is trampling on our freedoms. They want to pretend that Democrats are coming for people's guns. But let's be clear. Republicans want to pretend that people who support gun safety measures are coming for everybody's guns. We're not. We're coming for the end to gun violence. We're coming for the end of this public health crisis. We're coming for the end of a society where the number of guns exceeds the number of people. We're coming for the end of weak gun laws that allow people to buy an assault rifle and kill and traumatize school children, traumatize teachers, and traumatize grocery patrons. That's what we're coming for. And it doesn't require taking away people's right to bear arms. Our work is about saving people's lives. We will not succumb to the nihilist, insurrectionist view of the Second Amendment. We will not allow the apologists for gun violence to win. We will double down on a public health response to the public health emergency that is gun violence in our country. And together, we will end this crisis once and for all. I now yield to the gentle lady from Texas, Ranking Member Sheila Jackson Lee. Let me thank the gentle woman and ranking subcommittee member from Missouri, Congresswoman Bush. Let me acknowledge our chair and uh, from the Oversight Committee uh, and as well a chair from Judiciary and of course the ranking members of the full committees on oversight, Congressman Raskin, and of course uh, the ranking member of the 
Judicious Judiciary Committee, uh, Mr. Nadler. I thank them for their service and leadership. And I thank Mr. Chairman for uh, convening a hearing that will evidence a very sharp contrast in the issue of saving lives. I do want to acknowledge, in particular, the Moms Demand Action and the many other uh, good people of advocates who are wanting to have a reasonable protocol and structure for the owning of guns in America. I call you patriots, and I'm grateful for your presence here today. I call those who sadly and devastatingly are either the family members of victims long gone or who are victims themselves. I thank you for your courage. I acknowledge the witnesses here today, and I hope that they will understand that this democratic process is both a purpose with a purpose, and the purpose, of course, is truth. I'm incredulous that we are holding this hearing. I'm stunned. I'm almost in a sense of pain, because we've had over 100 mass shootings only since the beginning of 2023. Constant range of gunfire across America. Sometimes one would think during the week you would be relieved, but it is during the week, it is on the weekend, it's on Friday night, it's on Saturday night, it's on Sunday when many people in America are seeking the solace of faith. It is in our temples, synagogues, churches. It is in places in the park, schools, hospitals, and beyond. As far back as 1886, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives have been one of the countries, this country's most important federal agencies, fulfilling a multifaceted mission to protect American communities from violent crime while keeping us safe through regulation and enforcement of federal laws. Today's ATF's role is more crucial than ever before to help with public safety as there are more guns in the United States than people. The number one killer for children is homicide and the tool of the homicide are guns. Precious children, America's children, America's future. Fueled by politics and anxieties brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic, firearm sales have surged. Uh, in 2021, Americans purchased approximately 19 million firearms, down 12.5 percent from 2020, according to several industry estimates. But 2021 was still the industry's second busiest year on record, while last year was the third busiest. We rely on the ATF to ensure firearms do not end up in the hands of those who should not have them. That's all. That's all they do. And to regulate the purchase and transfer of firearms, licensing of firearms, manufacturers and dealers, and innovations within the industry to ensure compliance with federal law, particularly when manufacturers and dealers attempt to circumvent long-standing statutes and regulation. Contrary to what some of my Republican colleagues might say, evidence shows that more guns lead to more shootings. Gun violence is now the leading cause of death among children, as I said, while an average of 70 women are shot and killed by an intimate partner every month and every day 316 people on average are shot. Congresswoman Bush's story is real, evident, and it is painful. In an average year, guns account for roughly two-thirds of homicides. However, in 2020, 77% of murders involve firearms. Despite these appalling statistics, congressional Republicans, aided and abetted by extreme rulings from the federal judiciary in favor of possessing and carrying firearms, have allowed our communities to be flooded with the guns of every kind even in grocery stores and shopping at our major box stores on a Saturday morning. This push to reduce regulation and enforcement along with the surge in gun sales has only made communities across the country, rural, urban, and suburban, less safe. 
Tragically, mass shootings have become an all too common occurrence and stolen guns, untraceable weapons, firearms purchased in states with fewer restrictions on gun purchases, ghost guns are trafficked through the iron pipeline into states with stiffer laws boosting their gun-related crimes. It is ironic that yesterday with the two-year anniversary of the massacre of 10 people, including a police officer, at the King Super Supermarket in Boulder, Colorado, and Republicans are here today to attack the ATF and mount a defense of every firearms and modification involved in that shooting. I commend the ATF for their work in identifying a problem and providing guidance to prevent the harm created by the misuse of stabilizing braces, which convert everyday firearms into killing machines. I want to just remind everybody of ghost guns, ghost guns that led a shootout in my city against three police officers. I would point out that the ATF performed a similar analysis during the previous administration to create a rule for bump stocks following the mass shooting in Las Vegas that left 60 people dead. In both cases, the firearms and hardware used by the shooters were legally purchased and possessed, but it was evident that something had been done or had to be done after seeing the destruction they caused. And while the vast majority of guns are purchased by law-abiding citizens, there are many ways that legal guns end up in the hands of those who should not have them. And Democrats have never interfered with the purchase of law-abiding citizens under the Second Amendment. And while the vast majority of guns are purchased, uh, the reporting from ATF indicates that more than one million guns were stolen from private citizens in the five-year period from 2017 to 2021. That number is very likely much higher since there is no law that requires gun owners to report theft or loss of firearm. Again, ironically, Republicans have attacked the very da database that ATF maintains to track weapons and solve problems. The a ATF has taken affirmative steps to prevent future violence using technology to get violent criminals off the streets. In 2016, ATF created a, created a crime gun intelligence centers launched as an interagency collaboration designed to collect, analyze, and distribute intelligence data about crime, guns, mass shootings, and major incidents across multiple jurisdictions. The 25 CGICs strategically located, Mr. Chairman, as I close, I would like to finish this last paragraph. Through their work, more than 616,000 investigative leads were generated by CGIs in 2020 and 490,080 800 crimes were traced back to their origins. In my home state and in Houston, police department and other local agencies joined the ATF Crime Gun Strike Force. Finally, that is why Democrats passed several additional pieces of legislation last Congress to ban assault weapons, bump stocks, ghost guns, and high-capacity magazines, encourage safe firearm storage practices, raise the age at which semi-automatic rifles can be purchased, pass a huge amount for violence intervention yeah. and to keep firearms out of the hands of prohibited persons. Democrats will continue to promote responsible firearm ownership through common sense laws that keep Americans safe and support the efforts of the ATF to enforce those laws. I don't know about anyone else here, Mr. Chairman. I believe in saving the lives of our babies and our fellow Americans. I yield back. Uh, thank you. And just for the interest of equal time, there's about two and a half minutes over. And we, me and Mr. Biggs might uh, take that when we have our questions. Uh, now I'm pleased to introduce our witnesses today. Alex Bosco is a Marine Corps and Army veteran and the founder of SB Tactical and the inventor of the pistol stabilizing brace. Amy Schwerer is a senior legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Ms. Schwerer is an expert on the Second Amendment and firearms in the United States, and in 2022 received the Second Amendment Institute's 2022 Gun Rights Champion Award. Uh, and Matt, Mr. Okay, help me with your last name. Lossier. 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 Thank you. <laughs> you are forgiven. Uh, Matthew Lorcier is an attorney and partner at the Zermay Lorcier. 
As an attorney, Mr. Larcier has represented federal firearms licenses who have, licensees rather, who have had their licenses revoked by the ATF. He has also written extensively on the Second Amendment and firearms law. And Rob Wilcox is the federal legal director at Every Town for Gun Safety, leading the, uh, leading the organization's federal policy work and has served on the board of New Yorkers Against Gun Violence. I look forward to hearing from the witnesses today on these very important issues regarding Americans' Second Amendment rights. Uh, pursuant to Committee Rule 9G, the witnesses will please stand and raise their right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Okay. Let the record show that the witnesses all answered in the affirmative. You can sit down. Thank you. We appreciate all of you being here today and look forward to your testimony. Let me remind the witnesses that they... Uh, that we have read your written statements and they will appear in full in the hearing record. Please limit your oral statements to five minutes. As a reminder, please press the button on your microphone in front of you so that it is on and the members can hear you. When you begin to speak, the light in the front uh, will turn green. After four minutes, it turns yellow. And when the red light comes on, I'm gonna give you a little tap, give you maybe a play five or 10 seconds, then I'll shut you off, okay? Uh, and I recognize the first witness, and I'm going to, we're going to go in a little bit of a different order here. So let's go with Mr. Bosco. You're recognized for five minutes, sir. <clears throat> Chairman Fallon and Biggs, ranking members Bush and Jackson Lee, distinguished members of Congress, my name is Alex Bosco, and I am the inventor of the forearm stabilizing brace and founder of SB Tactical. As a naturalized citizen, former member of the Army and Marines, and small business owner, it's my high honor to share with you my experience aboard the ATF regulatory roller coaster. My original effort to help a friend, an injured veteran, to safely and accurately participate in pistol shooting and then build a business has put me and millions of law-abiding Americans on a whiplash-inducing regulatory odyssey that has serious consequences, including imprisonment. I urge you and your colleagues to reverse the arbitrary, inconsistent, and capricious action of the ATF. The forearm stabilizing brace, which I originally designed to allow a disabled veteran to more accurately and safely enjoy the sport of pistol shooting, has been used by millions of law-abiding citizens to more safely shoot large pistols. Each SB Tactical product is designed as an orthotic device made out of an elastomer material, basically rubber, and has one or more flaps and a strap to safely secure the firearm to the shooter's forearm. The stabilizing brace is not a force multiplier. It merely adds an additional point of contact at the forearm to more securely hold a firearm. Since I began my business, I've made every effort to comply with all the rules and regulations set out by ATF. After submitting the original brace to the ATF for their review, ATF responded in writing stating that attaching a stabilizing brace, quote, would not alter the classification of a pistol or other firearm and that, quote, such a firearm would not be subject to National Firearms Act controls. In the 10 years that followed, ATF repeatedly held that various pistol brace designs did not convert a pistol to a short-bowed rifle, and my business steadily grew. In 2017, ATF stated that incidental shouldering of a brace pistol does not result in a redesign and therefore is not a regulated NFA firearm and that, quote, stabilizing braces are perfectly legal accessories for large handguns or pistols. Along the way, and at significant cost, I worked with attorneys, former ATF regulators, and even a former presidentially appointed ATF director to seek guidance from ATF whenever we made adjustments to the original design of the brace that I had submitted back in 2012. Shortly after his swearing in, President Biden decided to reverse the previous decade of ATF decisions on stabilizing braces. He ordered ATF to treat pistols modified with stabilizing braces as short-bowed rifles subject to NFA controls. This change, the President said, would require an owner of a pistol equipped with a stabilizing brace to pay a $200 fee submit their name and other identifying information to the Justice Department or face criminal penalties. The president even admitted that his goal was to make these changes, and I quote, without having to go through Congress. ATF responded to the president's directive and published a final rule on January 31st, 2023. The effects of this change are enormous. According to the ATF, millions of Americans who followed ATF's advice for the past decade have, unbeknownst to anyone, been committing felony crimes. And ATF almost certainly underestimates the scope of the impact of the rule. In the final rule, 
ATF assumes that there are approximately 3 million firearms with attached stabilizing braces in circulation, but ATF failed to include sales after 2020. SB Tactical alone sold more than 2.3 million braces since 2020. Unless this rule is put on hold by Congress or the courts, the company I founded and many others will go out of business soon. Furthermore, responsible gun owners will be harmed. None of them want to run afoul of the NFA as a result of ATF's flip-flop. But neither do they want to purchase new braces when ATF now says that in order to use these braces, people must register in a federal database and submit their photographs and fingerprints to the government. The effects of ATF's rule is to put out of business the industry that ATF itself fostered for 10 years and punish consumers who relied on ATF's prior decisions. Ironically, this rule eliminates an important and widely adopted safety feature that will arguably make the sport of pistol shooting less safe. Ultimately, this rule should be seen for what it is, circumvention of the legislative process, in Federalist Paper 47, James Madison observed that, quote, the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary in the same hands, may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. It is in Congress that the legislative authority is vested, and the president must faithfully execute those laws. The president and the ATF don't get to do both. I urge Congress to reverse ATF's arbitrary decision, take back its legislative authority, and strike a blow for liberty and good government. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Bosco. The chair recognizes Ms. Schwerer for her five minutes. Chairman Fallon and Biggs, ranking members Bush and Jackson Lee, and distinguished members of Congress. ATF is, in some respects, much like the guns that it is supposed to regulate. In a vacuum, ATF is neither inherently good nor inherently bad. It depends in large part on who controls it and the ends for which its power is exerted. Like all branches or forms of government, ATF is imbued with certain coercive powers that can be wielded either properly or improperly and for either constitutionally sound or abusive purposes. ATF is not some natural born villain. The agency was neither conceived in constitutional sin nor did it come out of the executive branch womb covered in iniquity. It has the potential for tremendous good and at its best, ATF plays a vital role in keeping Americans safe from violent crime. Unfortunately, ATF also has a habit of turning into its worst self when left unsupervised by Congress for extended periods of time. And that's a problem because at its worst, ATF tends to use its vast and often unchecked regulatory powers to accomplish through agency rulemaking the very types of unreasonable and unconstitutional gun control measures that elected officials couldn't accomplish through the democratic process. The litany of recent abuses is long. In, uh, just last year, ATF, at the prompting of the president, implemented a zero tolerance policy for violations by federal firearms licensees that has dramatically increased the number of licenses the agency revokes. Where the agency used to see itself as partners working with FFLs to ensure compliance with the vast array of federal gun laws, almost overnight it turned itself into an antagonist. The new policy presumes that many violations merit revoking uh, in, in ATF, sorry, in excuse me, that many violations merit revoking a license absent extraordinary circumstances, even for first time violations. This zero tolerance policy uh, often applies to situations that are uh, basically clerical errors or paperwork mistakes that don't result in any actual harm. And this is particularly ironic given ATF's propensity for sloppiness with its own firework, firearms and records, which has sometimes resulted in actual harm. As Mr. Bosco explained, ATF also told potentially millions of American gun owners that despite a decade of ATF assurances to the contrary, their pistol-braced firearms were actually heavily regulated short-barrel rifles. And if these gun owners want to keep their pistol-braced firearms without immediately being branded as felons, they'd have to register each gun with the government and pay a $200 per, tax, er, per gun tax. Otherwise, yes, the ATF is coming for their guns. In another recent rule change, ATF decided that Congress hadn't given it enough regulatory authority and decided it would rewrite federal law altogether. Whereas Congress said ATF could regulate firearms, anything readily convertible into firearms, and the frames and receivers of firearms, 
ATF told gun owners that actually it could, without any supporting statutory authority, also regulate almost frames and almost receivers. In addition to increasing the number and complexity of records that FFLs must maintain, ATF told them that these records must now be maintained indefinitely instead of for 20 years as under the old rule. And why, you ask, did ATF impose this tremendous burden on FFLs? Well, because it might help the agency in 0.002% of gun traces where having records older than 20 years might meaningfully further an investigation. And not all of ATF's malignant actions are recent. Federal law generally prohibits the importation of firearms and ammunition, except for those that are useful for sporting purposes. For decades now, ATF has maimed and mutilated the definition of sporting purposes in a purposeful attempt to inhibit Americans' access to commonly owned and constitutionally protected semi-automatic rifles, despite the fact that millions of peaceable Americans routinely use these firearms for legitimate sporting purposes, to say nothing of other lawful uses, ATF continues to defy reality by insisting that they are not, in fact, useful for the sporting purposes. To be clear, Congress should not undermine ATF's legitimate efforts to enforce federal law and stop violent criminals. But it should absolutely step in to restrict ATF's discretion as to where it should focus its efforts and how it should wield its vast regulatory powers. It can and should consider statutorily undoing ATF's recent and not so recent attacks on the Second Amendment rights of peaceable Americans. You've asked us today, when is enough enough? How long, oh Lord, will ATF continue being its worst self at the expense of peaceable Americans? Respectfully, the Constitution provides a clear answer. It's enough when you say it's enough, and it will continue until you do something to stop it. In my written submission, I've outlined a number of specific ways in which Congress can begin undoing ATF's problematic attacks on the Second Amendment and the separation of powers and prevent the agency from using these same abusive tactics in the future. I look forward to your questions uh, on these important corrective actions. Thank you. Uh, Chair now recognizes Mr. Wilcox for his five minutes. Uh, thank you and good morning, Chair uh, Fallon and Biggs, ranking members Bush and Jackson Lee and distinguished members uh, of the subcommittees and those who've waved on. I truly appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning uh, my professional work on gun policy and gun violence prevention is deeply informed by a number of personal experiences. Uh, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York in the 1980s and 90s, where gun violence was not an uncommon occurrence. But at the same time, my father, who was a veteran of the Special Forces, taught us to respect firearms. Uh, at our family farm, we enjoyed hunting, sport shooting, target practice, and learned about responsible gun ownership, including securing our firearms in a locked gun safe. Unfortunately, my family's experience with guns took a violent turn when my 19-year-old cousin, Laura, was shot and killed by someone who never should have had a gun in the first place. Laura was extraordinarily talented, kind, and with a beautiful spirit. She was an outstanding student, graduating as high school valedictorian, and at the time of her death as a sophomore at Haverford College, was in the midst of her campaign for student body president. But in January 2001, when Laura was home on winter break, filling in as a receptionist at a rural county behavioral health clinic, a client came in and opened fire. He shot Laura four times at point blank range, killing her instantly. When his rampage at the clinic at a nearby restaurant was done, three people lay dead and three more were injured. Another mass shooting in a long line of mass shootings that doesn't always break through the national media. My aunt and uncle processed this tremendous loss while also fighting for a safer future for others. They became advocates who turned pain into progress, working to pass dozens of gun safety laws and their role models. I've now spent 20 years of my career working on gun policy uh, and law around firearms. And one thing I know for sure is that ATF plays an essential role in keeping us safe by enforcing the laws on the books. ATF is one of the nation's leading law enforcement agencies with 5,000 brave men and women doing work across this country in 25 field divisions and 200 local offices. Its mission is clear, to protect the public from violent crime. And they work hand in hand with our state and local law enforcement to solve crimes and do their job. ATF also regulates the gun industry through education and accountability, supporting those who want to do better and holding those who break the law accountable. ATF's role in this system is unique 
in its effort to keep communities safe. From 2017 to 2021, ATF processed nearly 2 million crime gun traces and 1.5 million NIBIN cases in order to assist local law enforcement in linking crime scenes, developing leads to solve crimes, and identifying gun trafficking channels. These crime gun traces show that guns move, are moving faster than ever from dealer to crime scene. Nearly half of these crime guns have a time to crime of under three years and a quarter uh, with a time to crime of under a one year. Guns with short time to crime indicate trafficking and it's where ATF and the industry can take action to step in and shut it down. Like, for example, when a gun dealer was selling multiple guns to people he should have known was intending to break the law. ATF traced those guns to multiple crimes, including murders. ATF investigated, and the licensed dealer, the gun traffickers, and the shooters were all prosecuted. The fact of the matter is, is that only ATF can make sure there's accountability from the shooter up to the supplier. ATF protects and serves at a time in this country when we need it to be at its strongest fully funded and supported, because gun violence is threatening communities across the country. An epidemic exacerbated by rogue gun dealers, gun sales without background checks, and industry innovations like arm braces, ghost guns, and bump stocks. ATF boldly steps into this space to enforce the laws passed by Congress and stop the illegal diversion of firearms. It's truly not lost on me, as the ranking member mentioned, that yesterday was the two-year mark of the shooting at a grocery store in Boulder, Colorado, where 10 people, including a law enforcement officer, were killed. The shooter used a short-barreled Ruger AR-15 pistol that came equipped with an SB tactical arm brace, the same kind of firearm that ATF now regulates. ATF has been there time and again under Republican and Democratic administrations to respond to these threats and enforce our laws. Its mission is to protect the public from violent crime and stop gun trafficking. In other words, its mission is to save lives, keep illegal guns out of communities, and save the lives of concert goers, lives of supermarket shoppers, lives of students, and so many others. And that's what ATF has done using the tools and authorities granted to it by Congress. I'm personally thankful for the men and women who are dedicated to their service at ATF and do this work to prevent senseless tragedies. Thank you again for the invitation to be here and look forward to the questions. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Lustier is recognized for his five minutes, my good fr Frenchman uh, friend here. Uh, much appreciated. <laughs> Chairman Fallon, Biggs, Ranking Members Bush and Jack Jackson Lee, thank you so much for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak on this important measure. I'm an attorney working in the Second Amendment space. Uh, I'm a child of immigrants, and I guess in following their lead, I decided to do a job that most Americans didn't want to, and that's protecting fundamental rights. I've been studying the law and policy of arms for over a decade, but I think most important for this hearing is my experience representing individuals and small businesses who have been caught up in some of the flip-floppery that ATF has engaged in, representing individuals and small businesses that have had their lives shattered, their employees left jobless because of, frankly, innocent omissions that were characterized as intentional misconduct by the ATF. These individuals, oftentimes, in the firearms industry, are employers of, with less than 15 employees. They're, that's the majority of the industry here. And I've represented these people for nominal or no fee, frankly, because I feel it's the right thing to do. And what I've seen ATF doing in these prosecutions is extremely concerning. The threats that are posed by ETF's overreach are not theoretical, they're very real. And they're not limited to arm braces or the zero tolerance rule either. I'd like to tell you guys about Patrick Tate Adamiak. He was a 28-year-old Navy sailor, and he was recently convicted for dealing in machine guns. Now, looking at that headline might not cause you to take a second thought, but when you scratch a little deeper, the machine guns Tate was convicted of dealing in were actually boxes of cut up, inoperable parts that the ATF had approved the importation and sale of as unregulated parts kits years ago. And then in an unpromulgated, unpublicized change of opinion, ATF decided that that amount of cut up was not quite cut up enough. They'd secured a conviction, and again, 28-year-old Tate, who dealt 
in parts that were purchased in open commerce with a credit card is now awaiting sentencing and his plans of marriage are indefinitely on hold. I'd like to tell you about Matthew Raymond Hoover, who's a political commentator who is accused of advertising metal cards with a drawing of an alleged machine gun part on it. A drawing. ATF took the incredibly aggressive position uh, and vindictively is prosecuted Mr. Hoover, suggesting that this drawing is actually a combination of parts. He is facing over 60 years in prison, a cancer-stricken man with not an ill-willed bone in his body and several young children. I think it's important when we think about the pistol brace problem to look at what law we're dealing with. We're talking about interpretations of the National Firearms Act. This is an act that in its original drafts sought to regulate handguns. And this is why uh, it, it sheds some light as to just how absurd the pistol brace problem is. Short-barreled rifles were added to the act to correct an obvious loophole to a handgun restriction. For, it was raised in the hearings that if pistols were regulated, but you could simply cut down a rifle, well, that, what would, that would be the effective equivalent of a pistol. Later on, to secure passage, the reference to pistols and revolvers were slipshoddedly removed, but the vestigial remains of a pistol regulation, the barrel length restrictions, were there, leaving the rules that we're now dealing with, the law that we're now dealing with interpretations of, as kind of like a, a cancer-prone vestigial organ. It doesn't accomplish anything useful, but as many Americans and some of my clients have found out, it sure can get you into trouble. The argument that these guns, under a law that was designed to protect conceal, designed to regulate concealable firearms, become more dangerous when you make them less concealable by adding a component to the end is so obviously and intensely contrived, it, it's kind of absurd. Insofar as zero tolerance goes, the GCA, the Gun Control Act, has made federal firearms licensees the gatekeepers to access to the Second Amendment right for most Americans. What we're seeing now is a two-pointed prong where ATF is revoking licenses for little to no reason. I've seen it as, as, as simple. The violations they were alleged were as, as simple as a customer had filled out black as their race, but not picked Hispanic or Latino. That didn't strike me as terribly nefarious. I think that this is, ATF has a moral obligation to really look at how it is enforcing these laws. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chair recognizes Mr. Gates for his five minutes. The Nonpartisan Government Accountability Office issues a report in June of 2016, firearms data. The ATF did not always comply with the Appropriations Act restriction and should better adhere to its policies. Uh, Mr. Wilcox, you're the witness the Democrats have invited here today. Are you familiar with that report? I am. And does the fact that the ATF broke the law concern you? Um, the report, I believe, supported ATF's action in cataloging records to stop crime. I'll read from it. It says, a technical defect allows ATF agents to access data, including purchaser data, beyond what ATF policy permits. Do you take any umbrage with that conclusion? ATF has been collecting out-of-business records pursuant to a law signed by Ronald Reagan, and President Trump digitized more records than any other president. I don't care who did it. I'm just worried about the impact on my citizens. And I would acknowledge there may be Republican presidents who didn't do enough in the 80s to protect our gun rights. But on this finding, the ATF had to delete 252 million records, didn't they? So this is a tool that's helped solve 50% of crime. Wait, 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 wait. Did they have to delete 252 million records? What I know about this tool is that it's Th a crime That's how I'm asking tool. you. Did they have to delete? You said you're aware of the report. Is that conclusion correct? They had to delete 252 million records. I'm not aware of that line, but what I'm aware okay. of is the tool. Well, I, I'll, I'll, tool. I'll represent to you that that's what had to happen. The fact that the government collected 252 million records that was beyond the law, beyond policy, never approved according not to me, not to my fellow Republicans, but to the GAO. Should that be concerning to us, that scope of records being collected? 
ATF's collection of out-of-business records was fully compliant with the law. That's the not what the GAO said, so you disagree with the GAO report. Well, there's two points they made. One is the collection of out-of-business paper records that, it, that FFLs keep. The second piece was the collection of electronic records that FFLs keep. And what the GAO said was they, the electronic records were not being converted sufficiently. And that's right. what ATF so that's fixed they had to, delete to become them. in compliance they with the law. Because they had gone beyond their authority. You see, that's, that's the concern of my constituents. When they go beyond their authority, and you may find those things virtuous, but no one elected you. They elected us to make the laws. And when we make the laws and they don't follow them, then people's rights get diminished. Another area is this issue of the arm braces. Now, in Mr. Wilcox's testimony, he says that an arm brace makes a weapon more powerful. Mr. Bosco, you know a lot about arm braces, don't you? I do. Do arm braces make firearms more powerful? They do not. They do not. Does it concern you that the witness that the Democrats brought would, would make such a claim that is, is obviously disproven by any utilization of those arm braces? I hope that my testimony today can help everyone here understand that the brace does nothing to make the weapon any more dangerous than it already is. And so when you've got the ATF going beyond their authority, collecting 252 million records that they have to destroy, well, that can just be explained because they're doing their best. But when Americans get inadvertently converted to felons because the ATF has exceeded their authority, there is no such grace for them, is there, Ms. Ware? Uh, that would seem to be the case under the, the recent policy change to zero tolerance. Zero tolerance for our fellow Americans when they're trying to exercise their rights and protect their liberties, but all the tolerance in the world for a corrupt bureaucracy that is violating the law, exceeding their authority, and collecting records that they have no business collecting. Um, I would make this final observation. I had the great privilege to spend two years on the House Judiciary Committee with the gentlelady from Missouri, and while she and I disagree strongly on this issue, her beliefs are sincere, and they are strong, and they are powerful, particularly when she expresses them. And so when she says to people that she wants to defund the police, she means it. And when she says in this committee meeting that gun violence is a public health emergency, well, she means that too. And our fellow Americans know the impact of folks up here in Washington declaring everything and anything a public health emergency. It means you're more likely to be locked in your homes, deprived of your freedoms, less healthy, less safe, less secure, and less able to live a truly American life. So know this, when the left talks about this as a public health emergency, get ready to see those enhanced authorities abused by the ATF. And Mr. Chairman, it is my sincere hope that, it's, that in the very near future, we will have those very folks from the ATF here. And I intend to be utilizing the new rules that we have in the House of Representatives to offer amendments to the Appropriations Act to zero out their salaries for breaking the law and abusing the liberties of our fellow Americans. Thank you, and the Chair now recognizes Mr. Raskin for his five minutes. Thank you much, Mr. Chairman. Um, the stabilizing braces have evolved significantly from their original intended use, which was allowing disabled gun users to fire an AR-style pistol. Today's braces are largely used to exploit a loophole in the regulatory structure to allow owners to turn their weapons into short-barreled rifles, efficient weapons of war, without triggering traditional ATF oversight of this kind of weapon. But don't take my word for it. Take the word of the people who use these so-called wrist stabilizer braces. Please play the video if you would. You see a gun like this and you're like, how the heck is a barrel with that length a pistol? Well, we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about SB Tactical and their stabilizing braces for pistols. And the end here, which is a rubber um, type of configuration. It's adjustable if you want to run your arm through it and do so you can and tighten it down to your forearm, which of course is what the braces were originally intended for. Um, however, you know, with the ATF rulings now, you can occasionally accidentally fire from your shoulder. And today on Sunday Gear Review, I want to talk to you about this SB Tactical HK PDW arm brace. It does help some people, right? So you can slide your arm through that and undo it and all that stuff. But we all know what these are actually used for and nobody is wondering about that. And we're gonna just see like, does it really feel like a stock, even though it's not a stock?
back to this brace. It changes the game, like I said. It, it gives you four points of contact with the occasional shoulder. Got it loaded up. Let's see the difference. Now you've got a very shorty boy, right? So you can put this guy, obviously, in a, a briefcase if you wanted to, in a backpack. Mr. Wilcox, why are short-barreled rifles more dangerous and strictly regulated than other kinds of firearms? Uh, short-barreled rifles are more easily concealable than long-barreled rifles, and, but more, have more destructive power than traditional handguns. Uh, for example, common ballistic vests worn by police protect against handgun ammunition, uh, while rifle ammunition, like those filed by short-barreled rifles, can penetrate it. And what's the difference between a short-barreled rifle and a firearm with a stabilizing brace? as we saw uh, brandished in the video there, and as we see on the poster behind me. Uh, when it comes to usability, I think next to none. There really is no difference in the power and potential violence of the weapon, and there's very little difference in the weapon's design. Look, our colleagues know that gun violence is the leading cause of death among children in the United States of America today. They know that more people proportionately die of gun violence in America than in any other industrialized country on earth, whether we're talking about Canada or Germany or France, United Kingdom, Japan, Israel, you name it. They know that the states with the highest rates of firearm, firearm deaths are the ones with the weakest gun laws, and the states with the lowest levels of firearm deaths have the strongest gun laws. But they say that all of this chaos and destruction is just the necessary price we have to pay because of the Second Amendment. All those thousands of people gunned down at church, in school, at the Walmart, in parks, and grocery stores are just the human sacrifice we've decided to pay as a society for our Second Amendment. My colleagues, this is a lie. Our colleagues advance a completely flawed theory of the Second Amendment, which leads them to oppose even reasonable common sense gun safety rules that the Supreme Court has approved and which the vast majority of Americans endorse. Our colleagues embrace what's called the insurrectionist theory of the Second Amendment. Our colleague, Mr. Gates, says the Second Amendment is, quote, about maintaining within the citizenry the ability to maintain an armed rebellion against the government, if that becomes necessary. Our colleague, Chip Roy, says the Second Amendment was designed purposefully to empower the people to resist the force of tyranny used against them. And Congresswoman Boebert says the Second Amendment, quote, has nothing to do with hunting unless you're talking about hunting tyrants, maybe. Well, this theory is completely debunked and destroyed by the text of the Constitution itself and by Supreme Court precedent. And yet their theory of the Second Amendment is killing Americans. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15 of the Constitution gives Congress the power to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of the Union and suppress insurrections and invasions. The Republican Guarantee Clause tells the U.S. Congress to guarantee a Republican form of government to the states and to protect them against domestic violence. There's six other provisions in the Constitution, including the Treason Clause, that debunk what they're saying. And we're going to have to get through their false notion of the Second Amendment in order to save human life. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Mr. Donalds for his five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, real quick, I find it interesting that my colleagues have no problem with the ATF going outside its boundaries with respect to this brace. Meanwhile, my colleagues have no issue with the fact that the President of the United States has made a complete bastardization of asylum at the southern border, which has led to more fentanyl killing more people between the ages of 18 and 45 in the United States. Fentanyl is the number one killer of Americans in the United States, and they have no problem talking about that. They don't even want to discuss it, but we're here talking about this. Ms. Swearer, you just saw the video that was up on the screen. Do you have a response for this video? Uh Yes, though I, I suppose uh, Mr. Bosco does as well. I, I think it's being used in a way to, to misconstrue the reality of, of SBRs. Um, like SBRs are actually still used uh, by, by plenty of Americans who do have disabilities, um, but also just from the, the, the standpoint of SBRs themselves, they were the loophole, an attempt to, to regulate a loophole while trying to essentially ban handguns. Their restriction under the NFA has always been irrational. Um, th th this idea that 
uh, somehow of a 14 and a half inch barrel is more concealable than a 16 and a half inch barrel when you walk in to commit a mass shooting, and that's why they choose it. it it's just not realistic. It's, it's the same gun. If you take that same gun and put it in a 16 inch barrel, if anything, the muzzle velocity will be increased uh, when, when it is fired. Um, so it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, and, and I'm sure Mr. Bosco has some, some thoughts on, on that as well. I mean, Mr. Bosco, you're the inventor. What do you think? Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, th I think there's a lot of people online, and we've seen some of those videos. Um, the reason I invented the brace was for people with limited mobility. Well, that was the, the inception. That was why I made it. Uh, it was for a friend. Um, yes, there are people that are not using my product the way that I've designed it to be used, but the intent has always been that. The idea that by adding a brace to a pistol makes the firearm more concealable and therefore more dangerous is laughable. It's a piece of plastic. It weighs a certain amount. It makes the firearm longer. It's not making the firearm more concealable. It's making it less concealable. Mr. Bosco, let me ask you a question. How many Americans do you think will become uh, felons as a result of this rule? Well, um, I think we should probably look at what Congressional Research Services did. Um, they came up with a study that said anywhere between 10 and 40 million Americans own uh, arm braces at this moment. If we use the smallest number that they have, which is 10 million, you will have an effect that come, I believe it's May 16th, which is, which is the deadline, uh, if someone wasn't smart enough to look up the Federal Register who didn't know about this rule, from one day to the next, he will be in possession of an unregistered short barreled rifle, and uh, he will be committing a crime which is punishable of up to 10 years in prison. It's a felony offense, $250,000 fine. So in order to avoid this, the, the American would have to spend $200, get their fingerprints taken, get a photo of them? given to the ATF, am I correct in that? So the, the agency, even with this, has flip-flopped back and forth. Originally, it was, they were suggesting that Americans pay $200. Uh, then well, the and Mr. Bosco, not, not to totally cut you off, let me ask you this question real quick. Um, did Congress pass a law to stipulate the ATF do this? Unequivocally, no. Mr. Wilcox, how you doing? Fellow Brooklynite over here. Um, grew up the same time. Let me ask you this question. Do you think it's okay for the ATF to act outside of congressional legislative authority criminalizing 10 million Americans who are currently law-abiding citizens? It's good to see another proud son of Brooklyn. Uh, I don't think believe that is what uh, ATF is doing here, so I disagree with the premise. Do you think that by this rule there will not be 10 million felons in the United States because they bought a product that the ATF authorized to be sold, and that the ATF said was legal up until the Biden administration. So not liking a law isn't a reason for ATF not to. Well, Mr. Wilcox, there's no law. Congress didn't pass it. That's a rule from ATF. Let me ask you this question. Do you believe in separation of powers? Of course. Do you believe that the legislative power resides within the congressional body and not the executive? I do. So then why do you think it's okay for the ATF to come up with some rule with the force of law that Congress did not pass? Congress passed the law 90 years ago, and ATF is So you're saying to me that a law that Congress passed 90 years ago allows for 10 million Americans to become felons today? Congress passing a law allows ATF to regulate as technology changes. Come on, Mr. Wilcox. Don't do that to the American people. We know better. Don't do that. I yield. Thank you very much. Chair recognizes uh, Mr. Nadler for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gun violence continues to take the lives of more than 100 Americans every day. It changes how safe we feel in our schools and in our houses of worship. It reduces vibrant cities to somber headlines. It takes our loved ones, old and young, and leaves us with another anniversary of lives cut short in a community forever changed. One of those tragic anniversaries was yesterday. On March 2, 2021, at 2.30, a shooter opened fire in the parking lot of a supermarket in Boulder, Colorado. The shooter used a pistol with a stabilizing brace an accessory that turned the gun into a concealable assault rifle. Ten people were killed, including Officer Eric Talley, a father of seven, and one of 69 officers killed on duty that year. It is against this sobering backdrop that Republicans have called this hearing to criticize the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. 
the law enforcement agency tasked with keeping guns out of the wrong hands. Rather than inviting the agency's director for serious discussions of ATF's work, the majority is called representatives of the gun industry and those who profit from defending them. The witnesses include the person who invented and sells stabilizing braces just like the one used to kill 10 people in Boulder. At least Republicans are transparent about their goal. They have introduced a bill to abolish the ATF. They seek to eliminate the law enforcement agency responsible for protecting communities from gun violence, stopping gun trafficking, and ensuring lawful and responsible gun ownership. Local law enforcement depends on ATF to provide resources that help them solve crimes and prevent gun violence. But the majority seeks to strip them of this vital assistance that keeps their communities safe. It is essential that we conduct oversight of our agencies to make sure they are fulfilling their missions. But today's hearing makes no attempt at that. Instead, it shows how radically out of step my Republican colleagues are with both the American people and with law enforcement. Democrats have put forth a variety of solutions to prevent gun violence, to support law enforcement, and to solve crimes. But our colleagues across the aisle continue to push for unfettered access to assault weapons, concealable rifles, and ghost guns. As Republicans continue to seek freedom from gun regulation, we will continue to seek communities free from violence. We know that the Second Amendment, only half of which the chairman quoted, reads, quote, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms should not be infringed, unquote. We know that it was adopted because of the framers' fear of standing armies. This fact was not disputed, and the Second Amendment turned into a general license for the, pro for the private possession of firearms until an extremist Supreme Court decided the Heller case 11 years ago. Mr. Wilcox, we've heard a lot of talk today about the ATF's rule subjecting firearms equipped to stabilizing braces to regulation. Does that rule do anything more than close a loophole that allowed people to evade public safety regulations simply by adding accessories to pistols to transform them into short-barreled rifles and again, short-barreled rifles have been regulated under the National Firearms Act passed by Congress in 1934, haven't they? Uh, thank you, Ranking Member. Uh, yes, you're, you're correct. Uh, this was ATF uh, enforcing a law that's been on the books for 90 years, catching up with changing in technology and, and regulating weapons that Congress long ago decided needed to be treated differently than, than other firearms. And Mr. Wilcox, more than 300 Americans are shot every day and more than 100 of those people who face gun violence lose their lives every day. Do other countries have similar rates of gun violence and gun deaths? And if not, what, in your opinion, accounts for the difference? So right now, the United States has a gun homicide rate 26 times higher than other high-income countries. Uh, I think that's what we've had enough of, and what we need is strong gun laws, because the states with strong gun laws have less gun violence. And I'm very proud to have seen Congress, in a bipartisan manner, pass the first federal legislation in 30 years last year to strengthen our laws, invest in communities, and save lives, because that's our ticket. It's downstream investment in community-based organizations and upstream enforcement on the sources of illegal guns. Thank you. My colleagues across the aisle like to blame Democratic cities for this nation's problem with gun violence. Can you please explain what the Iron Pipeline is and how it contributes to gun violence in cities and states that have stronger gun regulations? Yeah, so the Iron Pipeline is describing a gun trafficking channel. It's how guns move from states with weak gun laws to states with stronger gun laws. But, but I really do think about it as just the movement of illegal guns. And, and what we know is that criminals are targeting states with weaker gun laws, uh, sales without background checks, gun dealers who they know will, will skirt the law to acquire legal guns and move them into our cities. That's the critical intervention point. That's what ATF does. Uh, just recently, they busted a gun trafficking ring that, that moved 500 guns that were acquired from online no background check sales in Georgia to California. It's why we need ATF on this front line. Thank you. My time has expired. I yield back. Thank you. The chair recognizes Ms. Ms. Bobert for her five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, it's interesting hearing the, the rhetoric from the other side of the aisle. I used to say we don't differ in our hearts. We differ in data. No one wants to see children injured or even lose their lives. However, especially since serving in Congress, I have seen that Democrats do differ in their hearts because they're doing nothing to save lives in the womb. We had a Born Alive Act where one Democrat voted in favor of a full-term baby who is being aborted 
and survive that abortion, would be born alive and then issued medical care to save that child's life. So we do differ in our hearts. I have not seen my Democrat colleagues defend innocent life, but they want to use these talking points of children in tragic, horrible scenarios as a political pawn to regulate law-abiding citizens. Now, for far too long, rogue politicians and partisans at the ATF have really run amok, infringing and trampling on the Second Amendment, the rights of the American people. This shall not be infringed, period. There's no comma after shall not be infringed. And it's trampled on by the federal government, by the states and local governments on a regular basis to disarm Americans, to make them subjects rather than citizens. And I stand by the statements that I made because this is to protect the people from a tyrannical government and it's for self-preservation. This is to defend yourself, your life, which is so valuable. But anyone remember, since we are talking about the ATF and Mr. Chairman, I, I actually second Mr. Gates's comments. I would love to have the ATF in here so we can actually question them on this rule. But do any of you remember Project Gunrunner, uh, Gunrunner and Operation Fast and Furious? Yeah, the fact that the ATF allowed 1,000, no, no, more than that, thousands of guns to end up in the hands of Mexican cartels and criminal organizations, and they lost thousands of these traced firearms. And then one of these guns was used to kill border agent Brian Terry, all through some brilliant government program. And it's absolutely outrageous. If you think the ATF is going to be successful in this, making millions of Americans felons through this rule that is an overreach of the separation of powers. You've heard it from the witnesses today who don't necessarily agree with my stance. Mr. Wilcox says that it's us to make the law. Congress makes the law, not bureaucrats. And they're seeking to make millions of Americans felons with this rule. Now, what happened with Fast and Furious with these traced guns that they lost, thousands of them, the records in question, um, well, a judge found that they were not covered by privilege and that they were supposed to be released to the American people. Well, what happened to those records? That's right, Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats ended the House lawsuit when they took control in 2019 and further buried this scandal. Absolutely shameful. As the National Shooting Sports Foundation has pointed out, in just the last five years, ATF, under political pressure, has at least on three occasions, through administrative fiat, changed long-standing positions to declare products lawfully sold in full view of the ATF and in reliance upon ATF classification letters to now be illegal and or regulated under the National Firearms Act. ATF bureaucrats are not only ignoring the direction of Congress, they are literally ignoring the law and trying to rewrite it themselves. A complete separation of powers. And I apologize, I did have some, some questions for the witnesses, and I do thank you all for being here and providing testimony, but hearing this on the other side and then just realizing that we differ in data as well as in our hearts because we do want to protect innocent lives. That is why we support the Second Amendment. It is your right to defend yourself and we will always speak up to defend life. Thank you, I yield. Thank you, Chair recognizes uh, Ranking Member Bush. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. St. Louis and I rise because the gun violence epidemic affects all of the people of this country but some more than others. I'm talking about children whose leading cause of death is now guns. I'm also talking about black and brown communities that have borne the brunt of gun violence and mass incarceration. 
but gun violence may, as we've seen, be a political tool for some of my Republican colleagues, but it's a matter of actual life or death, especially for black and brown communities. Last October, as I spoke about in St. Louis, a gunman fatally shot a student, her name, Alexandria Bell, and the teacher, Jean Kutzka, at Central Visual and Performing Arts High School, where more than two thirds of the students are black. The shooter's mother was concerned and a third party known to the family had taken his gun just a few days before, but he regained possession. This is why common sense, common sense gun safety measures like red flag laws that Republicans refuse to support, why they are so important. In addition to ensuring the safe ownership of guns, we must also stop the flow of guns into our communities. Weak Republican laws are flooding communities with guns that are killing people. In 2020, per capita murder rates were 40% higher in states won by Donald Trump than those won by Joe Biden. Nine of the 10 states with the highest gun mortality rates, including my state of Missouri, are red states. Mr. Wilcox, first of all, thank you for your strong, well-informed advocacy. Um, I wanna build on Mr. Nadler's question. Can you explain how the iron pipeline and weak Republican laws, uh, gun laws, disproportionately harm black and brown communities? Uh, yes, ranking member, and thank you for the question. Um, as, as you stated, what we see pretty clearly from examining gun laws and looking at rates of gun violence is states with stronger gun laws see less gun violence. Uh, why is that? It's because it's too easy for guns to be illegally diverted from legal commerce, responsible law-abiding citizens, into gun trafficking channels. What are the ways that that happens? No background check gun sales, straw purchasing, gun theft, and rogue gun dealers. Now, we're here to talk about ATF, and that is exactly what they're there to focus on, is that diversion of illegal guns. Because we have to invest in communities, but we also have to stop the flow of illegal guns. And that's exactly what ATF is here to do, and that's exactly why we need them to be well-resourced and supported in doing it. One of the most troubling things we saw during the pandemic most recently is guns are moving even faster from dealer to, the, uh, to, to crime scenes, especially when it comes to young people. You see almost 40% of guns that were used in crime by young people in 2021 move from the gun dealer to that young person's hand in under a year. That's where we have to intervene. That's where we have to stop it. And for those in the industry that want to help out, let's give them that tools and education. For those who want to look the other way, let's actually hold them accountable. Thank you, thank you. And uh, instead of blaming, as we often hear, black and brown communities for gun deaths, we need to, and I will continue to say it, make sure that there's a public health approach to address this pandemic, this epidemic. Mr. Wilcox, um, can you uh, tell us how can a carceral strategy solve the gun violence epidemic? I don't think you can do it alone. I, I think there has to be accountability, but I think we also need investment. Uh, we need investment in community-based organizations that are doing the work on the ground, proven effective with cognitive behavioral health therapy, hospital-based violence intervention, street interruption. These are proven effective programs that we need to be investing in to intervene prior to acts of violence. On the other hand, there are laws and people have to be held accountable if there's violence, but more importantly, if they're moving guns into the iron pipeline, into the gun trafficking pipeline. We have to invest downstream in community and we have to hold upstream accountable the suppliers of illegal guns. Thank you, because a carceral strategy cannot be the answer. Um, thank you for that. Uh, I think it's a critical point that you just made and just our response to this crisis cannot be mass incarceration. I um, just wanna make that clear. Many communities around this country face high rates of gun violence and are disproportionately targeted by the carceral infrastructure that becomes the default response to every single social problem. This only results in compounding trauma and a cycle of violence that doesn't help anyone. The only path forward is through investing in our communities using evidence-based public health strategies that will solve this public health crisis. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. Chair recognizes Mr. Moore for his five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, first, let me say uh, mass shootings are de defined when, when you have a shooting with three or more people die. We had 74 people in the U.S. die in mass shootings last year. We've had 107,000 opioid overdoses. 
Number one killer of people between the ages of 18 and 45 is opioid. And based on testimony we've been hearing about the open border, they're getting younger and younger. So if we really, really care about young people in this country dying, we need to address the issue of opioids and those poisonings, that sort of thing, rather than this, this type of hearing here and trying to come after law-abiding citizens. Mr. Bosco, I, uh, I have a district that has more veterans in it than any district in Alabama. I have Fort Rucker and Maxwell Gunner. And, you know, one of the things we do for wounded warriors very often is we'll take them offshore fishing. I've hosted a couple of tournaments and take them out, let them shoot, hunt. It kind of gives them their life back. It gives them opportunities to do things. So tell me a little, when you invented this pistol brace, what was your motivation? Well, I mean, I was out of range. Um, a lot of us veterans um, enjoy shooting sports, shooting guns safely. Um, and a range officer was out there and he essentially told my buddy that he didn't want him shooting the weapon the way he was shooting it because in his opinion it was, he was firing it unsafely. So um, now your buddy is? He's a, he's a vet. He wounded lost, warrior? Yeah, he's a wounded warrior, lost a limb. Go ahead, and, sir. Um, he essentially, obviously you obey the range officer's rules, um, but the initial impetus was to get this guy back out there shooting a firearm safely. Um, and uh, I think it did a good job of that. And it's brought a lot of other veterans back to shooting sports. It's the one thing that all of us enjoy doing. You know, I don't even think my colleague would disagree that it's something that veterans do. I mean, his father did it. Um, I train my kids the right way. It's something that, that, that really helps. It's cathartic uh, to, to, uh, to other veterans, including wounded veterans. And it's cathartic to people who just want to go out there and enjoy it. I mean. There shouldn't be any, I really don't think there's, I mean, we're, we're all talking about Second Amendment issues here. I was really looking forward to talking about how this brace helps other people, how it helps wounded veterans, how it helps um, people with limited mobility. Um, it, it's, it's a piece of plastic that allows people to shoot a firearm better. That's what it is. You know, and, I, and my daughters shoot, and uh, they, I understand that the brace allows three points of contact, so some of the wounded among us, some of the weaker maybe, couldn't hold a handgun. It allows them an opportunity to shoot as well. Is that correct? That's, that's exactly right. All it does is allows for a third point of contact to help you fire the weapon more safely. Nothing about this product makes the weapon any more dangerous. Wait, no, so you're saying, number one, it, it doesn't make the weapon more dangerous. Actually, it probably makes the weapon safer. It does. And, and more accurate, I would think, which is a good thing when you're firing down range, I would assume. You want to hit targets, right? Exactly. So, so thank you for that. And Ms. Swear, i got to, got to move quickly here. I, I want to ask you, are you aware of any data that it suggests that an increase in firearm ownership leads to an increase in violent crime? Uh, no, not on, not on the whole. It's all about who in particular has that firearm and whether it's for, for criminal motives. But generally speaking, law-abiding citizens are not, uh, who are the mass of, of gun owners, are not uh, having that violent intent and they're therefore not a danger to themselves or others. Are you aware of any law that would stop gun violence? Is there a law that we could pass as Congress that would actually stop murders in this country by firearms? Uh, Congressman, even if you could pass a law outright banning guns, you'd still have to be able to snap your fingers to make them disappear out of the hands of violent criminals. And, and it would be an impossibility to eliminate gun violence. Um, we can certainly work on getting guns out of the hands of violent criminals and enabling law-abiding citizens to defend themselves with that lethal force, as is their natural right and their constitutional right. Um, but to suggest that, that um, we can somehow eliminate uh, gun violence, uh, I mean, that you're talking about eliminating human nature um, and it, it, this propensity that violent people have to commit crimes. Yeah, I'm, I'm reminded of Rwanda where they killed all those people with machetes, right? It's more about human nature, actually, than it is the weapon we happen to be using. You know, it's interesting because I, I, most of the, the cities that are controlled by the Democrats, I moved to D.C. and I'm here part-time. I've only been in Congress 24 months. But you, you guys, I feel so much less safe here and this is, I mean, they're pretty restrictive on firearms, so much less safe here than I did in the hometowns I grew up in the cities in my states. Because we, number one, we're normally, we're carrying concealed, so we're safe in that respect, but just the crime that we're seeing in the cities where they think they can pass a law to change human morality is just, it's staggering to me. And the statistics simply do not support that approach. But with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank you. Chair recognizes Ms. Jackson Lee, her five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you so very much. Uh, and uh, let me, this, this really warrants uh, 10 minutes uh, to probe uh, 
uh, this uh, thrust that we have here today uh, when we realize, looking for my paperwork here, we realize uh, that what we're facing is really a gun trafficking crisis that the ATF is trying to intervene and save lives. Uh, you take a city like Baltimore, I'm looking for an anecdotal story, uh, you will find that it is gun trafficking. To my good friend from Washington, D.C., uh, in Washington, D.C., I feel very safe, but the point is Washington, D.C. is being uh, flooded uh, with guns coming from places like Virginia, where the laws are loose. I mean, do we have any common connection here? Here's an article that says alleged gun smugglers indicted in New York under new federal law. Thank God we're saving lives. And so I'm very grateful to all of the witnesses. Mr. Laura Sierra, I applaud you, but I'm a fighter for the Constitution, the First Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment, and the Second Amendment. We are here, we are fighters for that, if I might say. And so let me just, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Basio, I take no back seat to fighting for my veterans. I love them. I love the combat soldiers and others, sailors and others, every list of men that you can imagine. Love traveling with the Marines, see what they do on the front lines. They're the first in, then the Army wants to tell me, no, not really. Each one of them ought to be respected. But let me just share with you. We know that stabilizing braces have been used to per perpetrate horrific acts of violence, including the murder of nine people outside a bar in Dayton, Ohio, and 10 people, including a police officer at a grocery store in Boulder, Colorado. You are a nice person and a businessman, but surely you do not want people using your stabilizing braces to murder police officers. Is that true? That's absolutely true. And so the work of the ATF is to ensure that we regulate not your work, not your, your brakes, but to ensure that it does not get in the hands of those uh, who would not uh, be able to, um, if you will, uh, use it as you would want it to be. Let me move quickly, thank you for that. Let me move quickly, Mr. Wilcox. Doesn't the Bruin decision represent a radical departure from the line of reasoning that Justice Scalia used in Heller, in which he recognized that the rights secured by the Second Amendment are not unlimited? and that nothing in that opinion should be taken to cast doubt on long-standing prohibitions against carrying of dangerous and unusual weapons. Just as the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs has endangered the health and safety of millions of women, do you anticipate that Bruin decision will threaten the safety of Americans and why? So I think the Bruin decision has created a lot of confusion. It's created an overabundant reliant on history, looking for a deep, specific historical twin by some courts rather than an analog. And what it's led to is perverse results. In the Fifth Circuit, I know the ranking member's home circuit, we saw the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals strike down a provision in federal law that prohibits domestic abusers under protective orders from purchasing and possessing guns. Now going forward, in your circuit, sadly, ranking member, domestic abusers under protective orders in the most dangerous time can access firearms. I don't think that is what Bruin meant. I do not think that is what the Supreme Court meant, but that language is too broad and it needs to be tightened up because we can't live in a country where domestic, dangerous domestic abusers, felons, gun traffickers can, can go free and terrorize our women, our children, and our communities. The most dangerous, if you talk to police officers as I do, the most dangerous call is a domestic violence call. I lost a beloved sergeant saving the life of a mother and son, but he died wounded and died on a domestic violence call. Let me quickly move uh, to um, this issue of FFLs. How does it impact public safety if FFLs are not being regulated, regularly inspected, and how would increasing the ability for ATF to inspect FFLs impact law-abiding citizens? Ms. Wilcox, I don't want to put anyone out of business. I'm just trying to save lives. The re regulation of FFLs. Look, I, I think it's incredibly important what this administration has done, and, and, and we've heard a little bit that I think goes beyond the facts. Because what this administration has done is to say we're going to target inspections on those dealers that are most connected to crime guns. Have you been connected to crime guns? Are there violent crimes connected to your store? And then they're going to look at very specific willful violations, such as you didn't conduct a background check on your sale. You sold to, knowingly sold to a prohibited person. These are serious, these are serious, serious Let offenses. Let me get this in. How does the ATF's ghost gun rule promote public safety and reduce crime? Okay. 
can he just answer since I got in under the bell, Mr. Chairman? Uh, yeah, and I apologize. We gave you an extra four and a half minutes earlier, so we're going to cut it off here. Thank uh, you Chair very much to all of the witnesses for their answers. Thank you. Chair, recognize Mr. Fry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. President Biden and the ATF purposely decided to put a plan together to take millions of law-abiding citizens and turn them into felons after May 31st, just like that, through a rule on stabilizing braces, which is nearly a total ban. This action, despite prior guidance from the ATF, Mr. Bosco, as you testified earlier, to the contrary. Does that sound crazy? Of course it does, but this is just another day in Joe Biden's America. In action, by this body, is sanctioning a lawfully established good actor in the community, your company, Mr. Bosco. Uh, let's just change the rules midstream. In order to register firearms under this proposal, gun owners are required to destroy, turn in, rebuild their guns, or fill out what is called a Form 1. This is the Form 1. It is a 17-page guidance on how to fill out a government form. This means that owners of up to 40 million braces uh, will spend a collective 160 million hours registering their lawfully acquired firearms to comply with ATF's unconstitutional rule. Anyone who does not register, turn in, rebuild, or destroy their brace firearm by ATF's arbitrary deadline will be subject to a 10-year uh, in federal prison or $250,000 per firearm. These aren't illegal guns. These are lawfully, these are lawfully, this, these are lawfully uh, acquired guns. For perspective, in 2020, ATF reported they processed 512,000 National Firearms Act gun registration forms at that rate, assuming no further backlog and assuming all affected gun owners comply with gun registration date by May 31st, it would take the ATF over 78 years to process all the pistol registration forms. The ATF is proposing regulations they aren't even capable of handling. Ms. Swear, who is in charge of making the rules, making law in the United States of America? Uh, that would be Congress. Would you say that it's a fair assessment that ATF is attempting to usurp congressional, uh, con Congress's powers and undermine the Second Amendment? Uh, I, I think ATF in recent years has sought to do that in, in several ways, yes. It, in, in, in what ways? Curious. Uh, so as I, I noted both in my written and, and my opening remarks, um, so one of them is with uh, this, this pistol brace rule. So Congress, yes, I, I think irrationally in 1934, but nonetheless did seek to regulate short barrel rifles. Uh, and ATF for a long time took the position that these were not short barrel rifles. And then just like that, it changed its mind and said we're going to override that. Um, with respect to uh, firearms themselves. ATF decided unilaterally that even though Congress said we can regulate you know, firearms and um, uh, frames and receivers of firearms, well, we think now we can regulate almost frames and almost receivers, um, which is really just a, a hunk of drilled out metal. It's, it's not a functional firearm in and of itself. Um, and, and in that way, we're going to claw back more power for ourselves. Um, so I think you see this quite a bit of, of ATF uh, not just interpreting the law, but um, intentionally misinterpreting the law to give itself more power. The pistol brace ban is unconstitutional, it's irresponsible, and it's quite frankly downright maddening. Uh, in this poster behind me, you see two guns. Mr. Bosco, would option A or option B make you a felon under ATF's proposed rule? Uh, well, option B uh, in 120 days will make you a felon. Do you think the common American citizen would reasonably be able to distinguish uh, which is the firearm of a felon versus a law-abiding citizen? Well, that's the whole point here. I mean, this is what I was talking about. Again, I have no disagreement with, with uh, Ms. Jackson Lee. I have no disagreement with my colleague with, uh, with respect to what the ATF does. But this is not what the ATF should be doing. The ATF is making a rule, okay, and they're saying that this rule has criminal implication. It circumvents the legislative process. That's what's happening here. All I'm saying and all I have been saying is that ATF should not be making laws. That's up to the people up in front of me. What makes this firearm behind me illegal under the ATF proposed rule? Well, uh, essentially what they're saying after 10 years of saying the opposite is that the piece of plastic attached to the back of that firearm, which is a piece of rubber with two flaps and a strap, is now a stock similar to the one in A. Does the arm brace make the firearm more deadly? For example, does it turn a semi-automatic weapon into a machine gun? It doesn't turn the firearm into anything. All it is is an orthotic device that allows you to fire that weapon in a more safe fashion. What is the impact of this proposed rule, if enacted, to your company? 
will go out of business. We'll go out of business. The ATF itself said that four of the five companies will go out of business in their impact study. They said that. So they know that they're doing this. Has the federal government ever indicated to you that they would be willing to compensate you for shutting down your business? Never. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know I'm out of time. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Fry. Chair recognizes Ms. Brown for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Unfortunately, we are all too familiar with the horrifying statistics that gun violence is the leading cause of death for children and teens in this country. Since the start of this year, 10 people, 10 people under the age of 25 were shot and killed in Ohio's 11th congressional district. 10 young people whose lives were taken too soon and did not have the opportunity to realize their potential. I have in my hand a list of reports describing each of these tragedies. Mr. Chairman, in recognition of the lives lost, I ask unanimous consent that this list be entered into the record. So moved. Thank you. Just recently, an 18-year-old high school senior was waiting for the bus at John Adams High School, just waiting for the bus. And while on his way home from school, he was shot and killed. Mr. Chairman, John Adams High School is my alma mater. A few days ago, two men in Cleveland were arrested for selling an undercover ATF agent nearly 100 guns as part of an ongoing law enforcement operation to combat gun smuggling. Many of the guns recovered by the law enforcement were ghost guns, firearms that can be assembled in parts without serial numbers, making them extremely difficult to trace. That's why they're called ghost guns. ATF estimates that about 45,000 ghost guns have been recovered from crime scenes since 2016, with more than 19,000 recovered in 2021 alone. As they are a massive source of violent crime, the reasonable thing to do is regulate ghost guns. But reasonable regulations to protect Americans, like tracking ghost guns, have been strongly opposed by Republicans and the gun industry. And that is despite thousands of American mayors and the majority of the American people begging for more regulation. Because in Republican eyes, not being allowed to manufacture and own deadly weapons of war somehow infringes on the Second Amendment. So, Mr. Wilcox, if you would, please describe the law enforcement challenges presented by the prevalence of ghost guns. Thank you, Congresswoman, and I completely agree with your sentiments and respect how you're lifting up the survivors from your community. Um, you know, I, I think this is one of the fastest growing threats to public safety in our country because the untraceable product is the dream of gun traffickers and prohibited people who want to acquire easy to make guns with no record and no background check. Um, I think, you know, we heard a suggestion that these are incredibly difficult to make, they're hunks of metal. Uh, that, that's not the case at all. These are readily converted by just about anyone. And, and building a ghost gun from the parts that these companies are selling is as close to gunsmithing as making a Lego set is as, as close to architectural design. Uh, these are not the same thing. This is something that is very easy to do with common tools and can be done in about an hour. So imagine acquiring these parts with nothing but a credit card or mailing address, some common hand tools, and an hour of time, and now you have an untraceable handgun. That's exactly what a gun trafficker wants, and it's why I'm proud ATF is stepping up to regulate that as Congress intended. On that point, can you please describe how the ATF supports law enforcement in their daily activities, particularly when guns are recovered in a crime? I mean, I, I, as I understand it, talking to multiple local law enforcement officials across this country, ATF is the best partner they have in federal law enforcement. They're on the scene, they're in the field, and they're doing the hard work. Supporting ATF is supporting law enforcement because that's who's helping them with ballistics information, with crime gun tracing, and connecting the dots to trafficking channels. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the only way to get from the shooter to the supplier is in partnership between local law enforcement and ATF. Thank you so much. Let the record reflect, I am a licensed gun owner and respect the rights of individuals afforded under the Second Amendment. However, we can preserve those rights while also implementing common sense gun safety measures, many of which are supported 
by our law enforcement to help them do their jobs and keep all of us safe. Despite this, we continue to hear talking points across the aisle against legitimate restrictions on firearms that would support the job of law enforcement and keep yeah. our children and community safe. In the 117th Congress, I was proud to support the bipartisan Safer Communities Act, which provided hundreds of millions of dollars to support common sense gun reform. In fact, Cleveland was already awarded $2 million from that fund to support city-led collaborative community violence prevent intervention and public engagement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I understand my time has expired, but I do want to say this. President Biden is taking action that is desperately needed and timely. And along with that, the congressional Democrats are ready and All willing right. to continue our yeah, diligent work to save lives and keep our expired. country and communities and children Mr. Chair safe. Recognizes thank Mr. you, Mr. Jordan. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Wilcox, did you or anyone in your organization communicate with the ATF or the Biden administration about these issues we are discussing today prior to the notice of proposed rulemaking? Uh, we submitted formal petitions for rulemaking through the appropriate channel, sir. Before the notice of proposed rulemaking? That's correct. So you were, you were in communication with the Biden administration wanting to make these changes? We filed formal petitions for rulemaking through the appropriate channels. Did you, who'd you talk to? I was a written submission, sir. Written, did, did you speak to anyone uh, personally? I didn't. Did anyone in your organization talk to anyone? Uh, I, I'd have to check, but I believe we submitted the written submission as a formal submission. People in your organization channels. may have talked to folks at the ATF prior to the notice of proposed rulemaking? Not that I'm aware. Did anyone in your organization talk to Mr. Dettelbach before the notice of proposed rulemaking? Uh, I don't believe Mr. Dettelbach had he came been in after. Did anyone Have anyone talked to Mr. Dettelbach about this personally? Uh, of course, we've been in communication with the ATF in this administration and in prior administrations. Talking to the, the director? You've talked to the director? Uh, I mean, we've, we work with ATF across administrations. Have you talked to the director? It's a simple question. Uh, yeah, I've communicated with the director. You've talked to Mr. Dettelbach? Of course. Yeah. And, um, well, I find that interesting. I just know, as we're speaking upstairs, the, the president of the National School Board Association is it's sitting for a transcribed interview because the same thing happened there. National School Board Association talked with the Biden White House, the Biden Justice Department, the Biden Department of Education, concocted this letter that set in motion this whole attack on parents showing up at school boards. And it looks to me like we have a similar operation going on here, where you guys worked with the ATF to, to change something that had been the law for 10 years to go after law-abiding Second Amendment Americans. Second Amendment uh, uh, supporting Americans. Mr. Bosco, uh, you invented uh, the stabilizing brace, is that right? That's correct. And you invented it for a Marine buddy, a friend of yours who served our country and was injured? That's correct. And you were told 10 years ago that the stabilizing brace does not convert a pistol into a short barreled rifle, is that right? That is correct. I got yeah. the letter right here from the ATF, November 26, 2012, right? And then seven weeks ago, 180 degree change, right? 180 degree change, just the opposite. They now say it is just the opposite of what they told you 10 years ago. That's Again, just to, I know others have talked about this, but I think it's so clear. 180 degree change. So in 10 years and two months, the rule was one way, and you developed a business based on the rule that they told you. Your government told you this was fine, and now they've changed it. That's correct. When did the bill pass that changed the law? There was no bill. No bill. That's the fundamental issue, right? No bill. Mr. Dettelbach, the new director, he never ran for Congress. I don't think he was ever, I don't remember a bill going through Mr. Nadler's committee last Congress that changed the law. I would have known because I'm on that committee, the Judiciary Committee, which has jurisdiction over this stuff. I would have known, I don't remember a bill passing the full Congress. I don't remember a bill in the Senate Judiciary Committee passing or going through the Senate. And I certainly don't remember a bill going to President Biden's desk and he signing the legislation that changed the rule. But this could potentially impact millions of Americans, law-abiding, Second Amendment-supporting Americans. Is that right, Mr. Bosco? That's absolutely correct. How many products have you sold just your company alone to Americans? How many stabilizing braces have you sold? Many millions. I can say that from 2020 to today, which are the, day, the, the years that the ATF didn't concern itself with when it did its impact study, we sold our company alone 2.3 million braces. So while they were doing their study, they didn't count the number of braces that were being sold? They, they, they didn't count in their impact study. That's probably because Mr. Wilcox's organization told them not to count it, right? 
I don't want to. <laughs> well, they were talking to him all the time, it yeah. sounds like, putting this all together, going after people who support the Second Amendment. How many Americans do you think it's total? So I've heard estimates as many as 40 million Americans could be impacted by this? Correct. Correct. Congressional Research Services has said anywhere between 10 and 40 million Americans own stabilizing brace. Unless you remove the brace, lengthen the barrel, turn in or destroy your firearm or register your gun with this government that you know you can trust because Mr. Wilcox has been working with them, you know you can trust. Unless you do those four things, what happens? What are you? A felon. A felon. A felon for something 10 years ago they said was just fine. That you build a business on and the business started because you wanted to help a man who put the uniform of his country on his back and served our country and was injured. And now they're going to put you out of business and make people felons. But don't worry, every town USA, this, Mr. Wilcox has been working with our government to implement this to target Second Amendment People, Americans who support the Second Amendment, such a deal, such a deal. That's why we need legislation to say this rule does, we need to pass that, that's what we do need to pass into law now based on what has happened with this organization. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, sir. Uh, chair recognizes Ms. Stansberry for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Uvalde, Buffalo, this week, Sumter, Milwaukee, Tampa. Some of you may not have heard that just this morning up the street in Baltimore. When will this violence stop? Our communities are living in fear. Our children are literally afraid to go to school. When will this body take meaningful action? This includes in my hometown of Albuquerque, where just a year and a half ago, a young man named Benny Hargrove, who was only 13 years old, an eighth grader at Washington Middle School, tragically lost his life. I want to tell you Benny's story. It was Friday, August 13th, 2021. It was only the third day of school. He had just started the eighth grade. Benny was a good student. He was a good friend. He was brave. And shortly before 1 p.m. on that day, he saw one of his classmates bullying another one of his classmates. He stepped in to try to de-escalate what was going on, but what Benny did not know on that day was that his classmate had brought a gun to school. And Benny died in the hospital at 13 years old. Now just this last week in my state legislature in New Mexico, my own state house representative who is championing these issues at home, Pamela Herndon, just passed the Benny Hargrove Safety Act in New Mexico, and our governor proudly signed it. But people across the country are begging us to take action because our children are literally afraid to go to school. I've heard a lot of testimony this morning from my friends across the aisle calling into question the Second Amendment and the right to freedom and law-abiding citizens. That is not what we are talking about this morning. We're talking about the safety of our children and our communities and about taking meaningful action in this body to stem the tide of violence that is affecting every single community across the country. I want to thank the moms and the advocates and the survivors who I see here in the audience today and who are tuning in here today to hear this farce of a hearing. I want to thank Mr. Wilcox for being here to help represent the voices of all of those individuals here in this hearing today. I've listened to my friends across the aisle take umbrage with our federal law enforcement this morning. These are men and women who put their lives on the line every single day to serve our country. When are we going to take action to protect our children? 
When is this body going to take meaningful action? That is what our children are asking us. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm deeply proud of the bipartisan community safety bill that we passed last summer. It is the most significant piece of legislation in 30 years because of the impact of the gun lobby, which I'm sure is loud and proud in the background in this hearing today. But we need to take meaningful action. And so, Mr. Wilcox, I want to ask you, what are the actions that we must take to protect our communities? Thank you for that question, Congresswoman. You know, I, I think first, we need to be implementing the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act and the laws on the books, just like ATF's been doing with ghost guns and with arm braces, with you know, unlicensed sellers who, may, who make get gun sales without background checks. We also have to keep passing foundational laws, background checks on all gun sales, ensuring there's an extreme risk protection order process across the country, and that people who own guns, like my family, store them securely. Because we know that 80% of the guns that are used in school shootings, those are coming from the home, the home of the parent or family or relative, and that's our intervention point, responsible gun ownership, which I think there is agreement on this dais about, um, as well as common sense and constitutional gun laws to keep guns out of the hands who shouldn't have them while supporting our federal law enforcement officers at ATF. Thank you, Mr. Wilcox. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back and I beg my colleagues to take urgent action now. Thank you. Chair recognizes myself for uh, my time. Mr. Wilcox, is a stabilizing brace a ghost gun? No. Okay. So I just want, for the record, to recognize the fact that our Democratic colleagues were in charge of this chamber for four years, and there was no legislation passed to regularly ban ghost guns. In fact, it wasn't even marked up. And my colleague just said that they were begging for action. Well, you had four years, uh, and you did nothing about that particular issue at all. We are talking about a stabilizing brace, and we're also talking about bureaucratic overreach and an end around to the democratic process. And I suspected that we were going to be insulted, and I wasn't disappointed. So, Mr. Wilcox, is it your firm belief that uh, less guns will equate to less violence? Thanks for the question, uh, Chairman. It's, it's my belief that strong gun laws lead to, to less gun violence. So, less guns is better? Uh, no, strong gun laws lead to less guns. Less guns are, what is, what is stricter laws going to do? Uh, it was gonna, it's going to limit gun ownership, wouldn't it? So we looked at every state across 50 policies, and what we found is the states that had the strongest suite of policies had the well, least amount of Well, that's not what I'm asking. And furthermore, it's, uh, you can play a game with states. You can compare Vermont to Texas, and it's very uncompare comparison. I can also compare North Dakota to California, and you're not, you're not comparing apples to apples. So I think that it's very uh, interesting to point out that in 1980 in this country, there were 226 million people. We had 23,040 murders. It was a murder rate of 10.2 per 100,000. And there were approximately 280 million guns. In 2019, there were 400 million guns, so a significant uh, increase. There were 16,425 murders for a murder rate of 5.0. We understand that one murder is one too many. But you can't legislate away evil. Uh, gun control in Mexico is very strict. In fact, for all intents and purposes, it's very difficult for an average Mexican citizen, although the Constitution says they can own a gun, it's very difficult for them to do so. And also, every single firearm in Mexico is supposed to be registered. Mexico has 124 million people. Uh, oh, 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 ma'am, ma'am. Okay. All right. Uh, she goes. She goes go. Please remove that woman, please. Yes, officer, please. You're removed. Oh. You're, you're breaching protocol and disorder in the committee room. He never took anyone away. No, no. Officer, please remove her. And remove the gentleman, too. And I'm going to read a statement for the other uh, folks in attendance. The, the committee welcomes the public to this meeting. We have people on both sides of the aisle. We have people on both sides of the aisle that uh, not only up here but in the audience that have differing opinions. While you are welcome here, I want to point out to the members and to the audience in attendance today, House Rule 11 provides that the chairman of the committee may punish breaches of order and decorum by censure and exclusion from the hearing. 
All participants will be required to avoid unruly behavior and inappropriate language. Expressions of support or opposition are not in order. I expect all parties to these proceedings to conduct themselves at all times in a manner that reflects credibility on the House of Representatives. Okay. Now I'm going to reclaim my time. I, you know what? I'm pretty emotional as well. I think some people are, and we should be, because it's my firm belief that if you look at Mexico with 124 million people, the murder rate in this country is 5 per 100,000. Mexico, with their very strong, strict gun laws, the murder rate is 29 per 100,000. That is remarkably higher. So how can that be if laws can wash away, unfortunately, human nature? They can't. And evil is evil. Whether someone is murdered with a gun, with a knife, with a car, a bomb, or even with your bare hands, the fact of the matter is what a firearm does is equalizing the playing field, particularly for elderly and for women, for folks that may not have the physical strength to defend themselves. So when we were called apologists for gun violence, we're using this for political tools, insurrectionists, and we're out of step. This is about the democratic process. We are supposed to pass laws. Congress, not unelected bureaucrats. If that's the case, we can all just go home. I'd rather spend more time with my family, quite frankly, my 13 and 16-year-old sons. I want to keep them safer. I want to keep everybody in this room safer. And I find it very hypocritical that some members of Congress hire armed security to protect themselves with firearms. So firearms are okay if they protect them, but not other people. The great masses. Alcohol-related deaths in 2020, 13.1 per 100,000. We talking about regulating any more alcohol? We talking about banning it? We're talking about making new rules to make it harder to get alcohol? No. Deaths by car, vehicles, 38,824, 11.2 per 100,000. Anybody want to ban cars? Any talk of that? No. Mass shootings, one is too many. In November 2021, in Wisconsin, a driver drove his SUV through a Christmas parade and he killed six. Was there any talk of banning cars? No. We weren't going to ban the Ford Escape he used or any like him. The Ford Super Duty pickup truck in October of 2017 to Manhattan. Drove his truck along a bike path and crashed into a school bus, killing eight. There was no talk of that. It's not the gun that kills people. It's the person pulling the trigger. A gun is merely a tool. So you have a stabilizing brace, Mr. Mosco. See, this is exactly what we have to avoid which is some minority of folks trying to silence dissent. Dissent shouldn't be kryptonite. We should have a civil conversation. We should have a spirited exchange of ideas. Mr. Raskin and I do, and I really respect it because he's good and he firmly believes what he believes. I believe a lot of the time differing, but there's a decorum that should be adhered to. So, Mr. Bosco, your brace is not a ghost gun, correct? Is this an insurrection? So will they be held to the same, uh, I don't want another January 6th, do we? Yeah, if they're Bosco. trying to overthrow the government, they ought to be held to the same standard, but I think they're trying to express their views. Oh, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Members out of line. Point of order, the gentleman's time has expired. Yeah, and here's a point of order. Uh, you weren't here to begin with. Ms. Jackson Lee went four and a half minutes over. We said that we were going to take, I was going to take one additional minute, and Mr. Biggs was going to take one additional minute. She went over by four and a half minutes. Mr. Bosco, you invented the pistol brace after witnessing a disabled combat veteran. Struggled to shoot while... Does the Capitol Police not do their jobs? What the hell's going on? All right.